It's shocking but true. You can grow your own biomass on your small farm, homestead, or estate so that you never have to buy a bale of straw again. Hi, it's Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. If you've been a part of our training program that talks about the utilization of bench terraces to increase garden space at your property, then you've heard me say many times, biomass, growing biomass, growing my own straw. And in fact, it is a powerful land preparation method to essentially start with a grassy plain. Now, let me share this a little bit with you. If you have a recently cleared area, a lot of folks want to go out and sod it. A lot of folks want to go out and try to get grass immediately. And what I do is I add a cover crop blend of various grasses instead of cereal grains, but nitrogen fixing and other types of plants to primarily just get as much cover on the land as possible. Now, if you have heavy deer, you're going to want to let that cover grow pretty tall so that it it survives the heavy grazing or the grazing of the deer itself. But most importantly, it creates biomass. It creates a large amount of straw, uh, different types of uh, mix. So for example, some folks will grow a plot which they'll open up once a year for deer hunting or they'll grow a plot which they'll cut with a sickle that, and use for bedding for animals. They'll grow a plot and then cut it once a year with a sickle or every quarter with a sickle to provide fresh greens to rabbits, chickens, or other type of livestock. This method is very often seen in rural communities and uh, I saw it many times written up in Heifer magazine. So they would talk about how they would help someone get a cow or they'd help somebody get livestock and then teach them how to grow a, a small plot for the straw, for the feed, and for the other nutrients that that animal needs and then use that animal's fertilizer to fertilize the plot. I don't see it in conventional uh, agriculture magazines. I don't see it talked about in permaculture, but it is a fast and efficient method that in an urban space, you can grow large amounts of biomass while growing soil, while building soil. So I demonstrated a lot. When we cleared the land, we focused on getting grass growing first, deep-rooted, variety of grasses uh, that are interplanted with cover crops such as clover and hairy vetch, as well as uh, alfalfa. Uh, those are seasonal, so they would go in at different parts of the season. Uh, but ultimately, I want to be able to grow four to five foot of biomass above each foot of surface space. So if you've got a thousand square foot uh, garden space and you're growing four foot tall biomass, that's cereal grains, that's different types of grasses, that's uh, different types of uh, nitrogen fixing cover, could be pigeon peas, it could be a lot of different things, uh, you're actually producing uh, uh, four times a thousand, four thousand cubic feet of material. And if you cut back that material, you leave a, a third of that material for the plot itself to decompose. The rest of that material can go into bedding, it can go into feed, it can go into your composting system, but it always turns out to produce a high-quality compost. So, for example, if you're using cereal grains, you could take the grain, you can take the straw from the grain and use it as bedding. The straw makes bread and other things or feeds chickens. The bedding might be used for your dog or it could be used for your, your livestock. But ultimately, uh, that soiled bedding could is now composted, ran through worm bins, and then put right back on the same place where it originally grow, grew. All that carbon is captured. All that, that nutrient is captured. All that value is captured back in your, your growing space. In the case of small basin gardens, so I, I was showing a demonstration video of building basins on a bench terrace. Uh, this is a model that I saw very very much so in Taiwan and uh, in Asian cultures that are temperate climates, but I rarely see it here in the United States. Well, this particular method provides uh, probably 10 by 10, 12 by 12 basins that could you could put chickens in there. If you have a small number of chickens in an urban space, you can actually uh, cordon off one of the basins and allow chickens to go through after season, and they will scratch up all the materials. They will fertilize. Uh, they will remove weed seed, but it provides a nice little contained area that will uh, soak in water, so it's self-watering, 
but ultimately can be planted once a season with some kind of heavy biomass. Now, another reason we use heavy biomasses besides the straw is to, is to suck up nutrients that could be trapped in the soil. So, if, for example, if you have a basin that is catching a lot of runoff from the road, you can't necessarily grow vegetables in there because of the runoff from the road. But the basin can flood and grow reeds. It can grow uh, different types of grasses. It can grow different types of plants that can be cut and then uh, composted. And those composted plants will not have any of the uh, the road runoff. So the, the rubber and the uh, oils that come off of a road, uh, the pollution from animal manures that might come off the road are actually compounded into a space that is uh, bio biologically active in the sense of, of breaking down those materials. Now, this basin, it depends on the situation. This basin isn't necessarily going to remove heavy metals and it's not necessarily going to remove pesticides and things, but the growing in that space often – you can find, uh, depending on the space, you can find plants that won't accumulate the nutrients. So you wouldn't necessarily plant comfrey in one of these beds because comfrey is a mineral accumulator and it could pull up heavy metals in high, if they're in high concentration. Uh, but you may mound the bed with wood chips and introduce mushrooms that can decompose the heavy metals or can decompose. Uh, they don't decompose them. They basically lock them up in the soil. Um, but these these systems become a way to grow value on your own property. So that's what we talk about on Prosperity Homestead. How do we increase the utility of the land? How do we ecologically manage the inputs and outputs of the property? And how do we reduce the amounts of inputs necessary? So in my case here in a temperate climate, in an urban space, my basins are often filled with composted leaves. So we will compost the leaves, turn them into a leaf mold, Mix it with straw, uh, whether it's straw that was grown on site or straw that's brought in, and, and then that finished compost is used as a mulch on no-dig beds. So the original basin is is constructed in such a way to, to not hold water but to slow, slow the seepage down, uh, but the raised beds on top of the basin are actually no-dig beds that will continually receive new compost and materials. Uh, this is a kind of system that reduces – first off, it's efficient in motion. It reduces the amount of walking you have to do across your property. It also is efficient in the amount of inputs that are necessary because over time you're essentially uh, pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere. You're pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere. You're basically turning air into physical objects. And so the 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 carbon that you're impacting in the soil – the carbon that you're developing in your compost is actually coming from plants that are grown on your property. You can allow these plants to grow to seed so that you have seed for the next season. And the selection of plants is dependent on your need. You may find spaces that are wet. You may find spaces that are dry. Uh, but ultimately, the structure that you develop allows you to grow uh, much more vertically than you would otherwise and that vertical space is a, is accumulation of resources that can then be cut for straw can be cut for feed can be cut for bedding uh, and you're now recycling more and more and more by capturing these nutrients on your property by handling them appropriately you put yourself in a situation of abundance you put yourself in a situation where your zone 1 garden becomes a feed for your animal system, where your animal system becomes feed for your composting system, where your composting system becomes nutrients for your garden spaces or bedding for your animals. And it's a very simple system. Now, it starts with a design plan. We always work with clients first on their design plan, and that design plan is oriented around your goals. In my case, I have about two acres to work with, and all of the idle space is going to be biomass, whether it's cereal grain biomass or biomass from uh, even uh, sun hemp, for example. Now, because I'm in an urban space, I want that to look structured because the zoning in my area has an ordinance about grasses and plants that are growing taller than one foot. So, if I have a bed with four foot tall cereal grains, so for, so for example, there's an erosion space where I ended up growing sorghum, 
the soil was the right type, the amount of water was the right type, but uh, this this hill was a heavy slope and receiving a lot of rain. I grew a sorghum plot there. Now, I didn't just throw sorghum all over the ground and let it be kind of a big nasty blotch. I actually cut it rectangular so that if you look down the hill, it looked like a rectangular grass area. So I, I cut it to look like it was there on purpose, which it was there on purpose. We were doing erosion control. But the sorghum had a root that held things in place, and it was intercropped with clover and hairy vetch. So I was putting a lot of nitrogen in the soil. It caused the sorghum to grow very fast, and it was about eight feet tall. Now, I ended up putting stakes on the four corners and using some string to keep it all upright because it was really eight foot tall sorghum grass, and uh, eventually it went to seed and everything. Uh, but because it was structured, it was in a, in a shape that looked like it was there on purpose, nobody complained. Uh, it created kind of a privacy fence, and it wasn't much different than people doing uh, different kinds of uh, 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 grass clusters. You know, you see those big clumps of grass that are 12 foot tall. Uh, it's no different than that. Uh, but ultimately, on our broad acreage space, which is really only just two acres, uh, by having paths, by having basins, by having specific growing areas, uh, when someone looks along that, they're going to just basically see uh, different rows of wildflowers, for example. And then next to the wildflowers is a row of, of grasses. And then next to the row of grasses is another row of wildflowers. But ultimately, that's my rotation. I would take the straw off of the the grasses and use it to straw the wildflower beds. And then at the end of the season for the wildflowers, I would basically uh, flail mower it or just mow it down. And then now they'd see a row of mow. Um, but I might introduce clover into it. So then, then they'd see a green row of clover that turns red. Uh, I like to use that red clover with the flower on it for bees. Uh, and it's just kind of a – it looks like it belongs there. Meanwhile, I'll pour wood chips on the mulch path for paths, mulch paths, which gives me accessibility, but ultimately outlines the different wide no dig beds. Uh, do you see how this works, folks? Do you see in your mind how when someone looks at your garden space, when someone looks at your homestead, small farm or estate, it looks deliberate? Now, yes, you could have wildflower beds that are 12 feet wide and, and, you know, blotched all over your property. But in the case of an urban garden, uh, you could have a little bit of structure in there to make that look deliberate. I saw one garden space that had a large blotch of – a blotch means just a, a, a sprawling uh, wildflower area that they mowed a path right straight down the center and – they, they mowed the path down the center because there was a, an archway at one end. So they basically took the mower, went through the archway, mowed a wide path down the middle, and then left the rest kind of just sprawling. And what this allowed them to do is to walk in there and pick the wildflowers more easily. And they had small children, so it allowed the children to get in there without seeing a lot of um, – you know, being worried about snakes or anything like that. And ultimately, uh, they ended up putting a, uh, a so there was the, uh, the, the archway, the straight path. They ended up mowing a circle in the middle because it's kind of a level space and putting a few chairs out there. So you could, it, you could walk down the path, sit in the chairs and relax. They had a little tiki lights out there and you could be a, in this wildflower bed without actually being con interacting with the flowers. Now, I would prefer just to wander through the flowers and, and pick them and, and such. But this is something that gave structure to what seemed to be chaos and allowed them to do something where neighbors may have complained because all wildflower beds, as all beauty goes away at some time, all wildflower beds eventually come all become all gray and nasty, um, which is they're dying in the fall so that you can get seeds. Um, but the access paths, the structure, the basic frameworks, some of the hardscapes gives it this unique beauty that folks really look forward to what you're growing. I know there's a couple fence lines here near the lake that have wonderful wildflower beds. Uh, they get cut down at the end of each season, and when they're cut down, you'll find out there's a little, pe there's a few small shrubs in there. Uh, so these few small shrubs get choked out uh, during the wildflowers maximum growth and ultimately uh, are seen in the winter as there are evergreens 
uh, with the wildflowers as a mulch around that those evergreens. I say this because, and I use the wildflower example because wildflowers are perhaps the easiest and fastest way to give color, to give uh, something interesting to look at, and very often distracts from eight foot tall, twelve foot tall uh, biomass growth. Uh, you know, if we didn't have the uh, deer so much, we would have six foot tall alfalfa growing, and uh, that's a great input for a variety of things, but ultimately kind of confusing to the neighbors. I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead, and we've been talking about growing your own biomass, growing your own uh, you know, resources on your property, but using structure so that folks aren't going to complain. They're, in fact, they're going to enjoy looking at what you have there, and you're going to enjoy it too. It's going to simplify your work. It's going to make things a lot easier. If you have any questions, visit us at www.prosperityhomestead.org. Thanks for listening.